All right, we're recording. Um, our agenda is light today. We have a topic from Alex that I understand will be brief, but Alex, feel free to take the time. <laughs> this is your meeting. Thank you. Um, can someone, um, I, I'm trying to share uh, the actual, um, I'm trying to share the actual slide, but Zoom's not letting me. Um, Chris, can you pull it up and share it, please? It's just one slide. Oh, I see. Let's see. Uh, the share screen is enabled, but uh, sure. Let me pull that up. Exhibit A through Z. Yep. Thank you. Um, so just to give you guys some background here, uh, I've been trying to, I've been trying to figure out how to unit test my uh, object graph hand proxy handler in my ES membrane project. And I realized that it's practically impossible. Um, the file itself is 1700 lines and the proxy traps themselves with all the distortion support built in already. That part of it is over a thousand lines just for the proxy traps. So that's a non-starter. Um, and it got me thinking, okay, how can I break this up into something that I can unit test individual pieces of and then compose them into a single object into a single proxy handler via weak maps going from one node to the next, I'm sorry, from one proxy handler node to the next, to the next, to the next, all the way ending at reflect. Um, and that's where I'm going. It does add some complexity, but at the same time, if I can test that things are working well, this brings a couple of benefits, um, which uh, the first one is it makes it much easier to inject a distortion proxy handler if it's based on one that is based on a class that can fit into this uh, graph of proxy handlers, not graph of objects, graph of proxy handlers. And two, like I said, unit testing. Um, so let me just walk through the basic idea here. Um, the one thing about proxy, about when you call proxy.revocable, you have to pass in a proxy handler. And that proxy handler is tied to the proxy forever. But there's nothing in the rules that says that that proxy handler can't be a single component, say a head of a linked list which is where my original idea started, or in this case, a simple directed graph. So that means that once you have this head proxy handler, which links to all the others directly or indirectly, then you can mix and match proxy handler components as you see fit. Um, of course, once you've actually initialized the proxy, in particular, if you've uh, decided to seal it, then you really don't want that list of proxy handlers, I'm sorry, that graph to change. Hello, what's this? Uh, you really don't want that graph to change after that point, which is an implementation detail, but worth calling out. So the idea here is your initial Proxy, your, your initial head will refer to a uh, to a subsidiary proxy handler component, which does initialization. It runs some quick tests. It, it does some settings, like for instance, if the real target is sealed or frozen, you want to seal. You want to populate and then seal or freeze the shadow target right away. And then you want that initialization proxy handler to just drop off the graph as far as that particular proxy is concerned. Now you'd still keep it in the in the graph for creating future proxies, um, but 
it, it would be transient. It would go away pretty quickly. And then based on whatever decisions that are made by um, individual methods within there, you would jump to another proxy handler component, which itself would forward to the next component and so on, eventually ending in um, a call to reflect, which operates on the real target. One other detail about this is I forgot to mention the name of the method that I would define inside of the proxy handlers to move from one to the next. And that would be a method I'm calling invoke next handler. It takes a couple arguments. It takes the uh, shadow target and it takes the trap name that we're trying to invoke. And that's specifically about going to the next handler in the graph. So, so uh, uh, there's a, some basic orientation I think I'm missing. The, the difference between the, what is the way in which the handlers differ from each other? And what Each handler ha handles one specific class of tasks. For instance, um, I might have a, a handler for uh, apply and construct. And for, for non-functions, that doesn't need to be in the graph. It doesn't need to be in the in the directed graph of proxy handlers anywhere. Um, another case would be um, if I wanted to do wrapping from one object graph to another. That is a very specific um, functionality that can be contained in a single proxy handler. So, are the are, is the selection of pro is so is the division trying to does it, is this in order to be able to apply various distortions and have different specialized representations of the distortions? Or is this just trying to break up uh, the basic undistorted, uh, tra you know, almost transparent functionality uh, into separately testable units? Both. Okay. Both. Um... I'm not at the point where I'm ready to implement this yet, but I've started some explorations. Um, okay. at, at first I was thinking a linked list and then I thought about conditions where I might want to jump from one proxy handler over several others to another. And then I realized, you know what? A linked list is not adequate for this. Um, and that's why I came up with this um, image describing math in what's, what in mathematics is called a simple directed graph. Yeah, Alex, uh, this, uh, this is very similar to what we do in Neon Membrane. Um, we, we also make uh, some optimizations on top of this. So there's a similar idea uh, where you have multiple handlers that can do certain things and, and the distortion included and so on. Um, for our case, we find out that this was too slow. Uh, too many function calls, like you, you, you die and run thousand, thousand cuts, basically, and everywhere function calls, call calls, and, and so on. So what we do instead is that um, we determine the state of the handler based on the state of the real target. And um, when a observable change happens there, we readjust the handler. And a case of it is, for example, uh, between a, a, a proxy that uh, wraps an object that is already frozen or, uh, or something like that, which in this case, you go straight into a particular handler. So because the, the, um, the handler itself is mutable, you can replace the, the trap at any given time. And I, I, in, 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 in the past, I always thought that was a big mistake. Um, it turns out that it is actually very useful for membranes. Uh, so at any given time, when we determine that you're making a, a particular change, whether that's because you are trying to freeze the proxy itself, and we determine that and make the adjustment, or because you are accessing a, a, a you're, you're checking if it is extensible, if proxy is extensible at that time, you go and check if the real target is extensible, and you determine that it's not, then you have to do the proper freezing of the shadow target. 
Right. So those observable, uh, observable behavior at, at a given time is the door for us to go and say, hold on, let me adjust the handler accordingly. Change the handler to maybe a, a sequence of handlers that is more optimized than a sequence where handlers are in between that doesn't do really anything. It's just checking if you need to do something and then jump to the next one and so on. And, and then subsequently, we reduce, we were able to reduce the, the, the handler from a sequence to a single handler. Um, and uh, when, when, when the optimization is the last optimization, like the case of frozen, it is what it is. It's, it's frozen already. So you know you don't have to do many jumps. There is no distortion, it's nothing. It's just straight to get the value out of, 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 the, of the shadow target. Um, so we, we do a lot of those optimizations and we, we were able to get it down to, I think, 5Ks. And I still hope that for the work that we're doing for realms, I can get it down to a couple of Ks um, in size. Um, and it's pretty fast. It's uh, really, really fast. Really? Is that code uh, up on GitHub? Yeah, that code is there. It's near membrane package. Yeah. Okay. okay. So I'm hearing I'm hearing some implications about this that I want made explicit. Uh, is my understanding correct that the arrows we're looking at, um, in particular the solid arrows, and um, and potentially the dotted ones, represent function invocation, or is it or am I misunderstanding? Trap invocation specifically. Okay. But it, but it is invocation. It's not like it's not dealing with the uh, with the handler object. It's like this is a a, a function call graph. Yeah. Although I think Alex was saying that he used a helper method for that, like invoke trap with the mm -hmm. name of the trap. That for us that was too slow. So we go straight. It's just AOP on on those functions, the points and wrapping functions. Yep. Okay. That but yeah, those those are the hard the the, the hard arrows are just. Uh, uh, things that will never change, and uh, the, uh, from what I understand, and the data one are things that might change because you make determinations uh, at any given time. At least for mm -hmm. us, we change those some of those. Right, and and because the the um, the object itself is mutable, you can represent that yep. by yep. updating its methods. Yeah, and and we do we we exactly have the same thing initialize. It's actually called initialize. I think. I remember correctly, it's the same thing. Like we run it once, uh, once we're ready to do any operation on it. And we, we, we do the tricks of at any given trap, we call initialize, or we uh, optimize the initialize. So it happens only the first time, the next time it doesn't do anything. It's a no op, op function. So the engines does, they can do a lot of optimizations there. So every trap calls, the head is basically a bunch of traps for us. Uh, each trap call initialize. Initialize the first time, mute itself by setting itself to no op. So next next time doesn't do anything because it was already initialized, and that's optimized by browsers. And then from there you go on and 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 uh, in every trap you go and try to decide if there is any observable thing that you can use to optimize the proxy handler. And if there is, we do optimization there. If not, we just go and do the regular process. Um, it gave us the ability to do very weird distortions. Like uh, we have what we call live objects. Live object means uh, sometimes you want the membrane to uh, re simply just keep uh, keep coming back to the original target on the other side and do the operations there. But sometimes you don't. Sometimes you want to take kind of in a snapshot kind of thing where if you don't apply any mutation to it, you are live. But the minute you do the mutation, we take the snapshot, and that's the universe that you see. That's the reality that you see. So we do some of that for some objects. And, and for that particular case, because you're going through a mutation trap, we know it is a mutation trap, and we determine that that's the first time that you're trying to mutate that. So we're going to do some optimization for you and then move on. Um, so those are very, very interesting I did, things. I did, I did not follow that. I'm not sure if I need to with this. Time, but I but I did not follow that. Uh, I, I think I think I did that. It, it's a it's a, a higher level abstraction that um, rather than representing things and comprehending them at the level of the proxy traps, that instead it 
it bubbles up to the level of the distortions that are relevant. Right, but what I think what Mark uh, didn't get was why we do the, the, that, that such uh, behavior of uh, an object that takes a snapshot. Is that what you? Yeah, the, the, are, are you trying to say that the mutation does not go through to the real target? You're trying to just right. locally? Yeah, I see. mutations like if, I, if I'm changing an array prototype to a string or something like that, um, or, or, or array prototype join, you're only mutating your version of join. Okay. It doesn't okay. go through the membrane. So in that case, we determine that this object is special and you don't, you're not allowed to, to modify that object. If you want to modify it, we do the modification on your side of the, of the, of the graph and it never goes through. But, but if you are not mutating and the outside does change the, the join behavior for whatever reason, because being polyfill or whatever, you still will get that version because you it goes through. It doesn't sure. take the full snapshot. This is it's copy on write. Copy on write, yes, basically, yeah. Okay. Is but, a, take the snapshot on write, yeah. Okay. Um, so there's a separate question of why is this particular distortion useful, but that I that I don't need to ask now. Okay, well, just to um, come back to what Carity is saying, um, I think Carity, you and I are actually going in the same direction. You're saying that this approach is too slow. Um, and you might be right, I don't know yet. This is an experiment on my part. But I do know that the complexity of my current implementation, which is not this, is so great that it drives me up the wall. I can't really guarantee that what I've done is correct. And slowness is, and, and speed is not gonna matter if you can't guarantee correctness in the first place. Um, so I think I'm still gonna proceed along these lines until I have something better to um, go with. And by the way, um, another of the changes that I'm making in ES membrane is initializing the proxy on first access. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I sent out an email to uh, SCS Strategy, I believe it was, and I'm, which means pretty much everybody here saw it, where I was discussing where I'd finally solved a problem where we had a sealed cycle. Um, just to reiterate for video purposes, because people on the people watching this video won't necessarily know about it. Let's say you have object in, in, in one graph, A dot B dot C equals A. So you've got a cycle. And then all three of those, A and B, are sealed. This causes a problem if you're trying to define, if you're trying to populate the proxy before you return it out of your object graph handler, out of your um, proxy handler. Creates a huge problem and a number of smaller problems that are not immediately obvious. Um, and the simple solution is don't do that. The simple solution is only initialize and populate the proxy when you first, when you first try to access its properties. Um, Otherwise, I guarantee you, you're in for a world of hurt and you won't even know it. And the sealed cycle that I mentioned a few minutes, a moment ago is only the most subtle and painful of those. I wrote, I had to re, I ended up dropping 400 lines of code once I fixed that problem. The delta was 400 lines removed more than added. So just don't do it. Um, it's a it's a design flaw if you don't know that you're going to hit that. Where was I? Um, yeah, I lost my train of thought. Sorry, guys. So I'm I'm just trying to explore this and see if I can get it to work. I do understand there's a cost from going from one function and one 
proxy handler to another to another to another in a linked list. And by the way, after the proxy is initialized, you wouldn't have the full graph for that proxy. You'd only have the linked list because once you're initialized, you don't need to modify it anymore. Um, and then you can decide to drop certain ones and reduce that list further if there's an optimization to add, but distortions post initialization should not be insertable or removable. Um, that's a decision that, again, once I realized that initialization is the key point when you do initialization is really important. Population, I should call it. I don't know what to call it. Um, yeah. I don't have much else to say on this particular thought, but it does lead to something else that's been ruminating on my mind and I'm not really ready to propose something yet for, for consideration. Um, certainly not to TC39, may not even need them. But I keep running into this problem in um, membranes development. And it's interesting. Where I need two tuples or three tuples, not, and, and by the way, I'm very specifically not talking about the records and tuples proposal that is being considered by this group. I'm talking about tuples in the mathematical sense, um, where you need tuples where one key is weak or both keys are weak or all the keys are weak. Um, as keys in a weak map. And this proxy graph is actually a, a good example of that proxy handler graph um, where you have the uh, trap name and the um, individual proxy handler trying to find the next proxy handler to invoke. That would be a composite weak map where the first key would be your shadow target and the second key would be your um, the trap you're trying to invoke. This problem pops up over and over and over again where you have a composite where you have a tuple of keys and you have to build data structures compositing weak maps and maps together to handle that. Um, it's not just this case, it happens repeatedly, at least in my design. And it got to the point where I got frustrated enough to say, okay, you know what? I need to not just generalize this into a composed one, but to actually pre-generate, uh, to generate these classes from a, um, as a, as a compile step or a build step. I'm not there yet. I don't have enough to actually give a, a presentation to this group, but I'm just putting the idea out there that maybe we need to think about that more. I mean, it, it's it's not just this proxy handler graph. It's, if you remember from the slide, I, I when I talked in, about, um, when I talked about how I go from one object graph to another with that proxy mapping which by the way, I'll be renaming to proxy cylinder for reasons I'll explain later. It basically, that is a one-to-one -one hash table. It's a one-to-one -one mapping from it, combining the, uh, the original um, object or proxy and a graph name that you're going to go for. That's a two tuple where one key is weak and one key is strong. That's another example. Um, again, not ready to go there yet. And I'm taking up time that might be better used according to the chat for Daniel to talk about continuing and to continue the discussion on REPLs, tuples, and boxes. If anybody has questions for oh. me, go. Hey, wait, no, don't cut off this topic for me. Well, I'm, I'm done, basically. Yeah. Well, uh, so I, I do have something to, um, so the, the, I do have, in a uh, fork that I'm uh, playing around with, not ready to really call attention to, a, um, a map 
implementation, implementation of the map API, where the map semantics is that uh, a key is a uh, is an array of uh, elements, and the implementation is a try in the um, uh, you know trie try in the order of the elements in the array, where for each element, uh, if the element is a is an object, then that that corresponding node in the try for indexing on it is, is itself a weak map. And if that element in the array is a value, then the corresponding um, node in the try for indexing on it is a map rather than a weak map. Uh, and it, it composes together fairly well. Uh, it, even does the enumer it even does the enumeration. Um, uh, and it's, it's actually uh, quite neat. Um, uh, and it, sa it sounds like uh, it sounds like that might address the issue you're running into, where you you um, are trying to uh, index not on the identity of an object or the val or or the contents of a value, but rather the successive elements of an array, where for each element you're doing either a identity or value. Is that is that am I getting it? Possibly. Um, I think so. I am. So go ahead, Bradley. Yeah. Well, that just sounds like composite key again, because composite key shows up all over the place. Yeah. Um, but I, the I, was, unique, I was thinking about that myself. Yeah. The unique thing that you stated was you want some of them to be strong links. And it seems like over time, you want to keep the identity for the mapping, but allow partial garbage collection of your tuple. Is that correct? Right. Um, just so everybody's aware, I am starting to rapidly prototype something. I have an idea on how to actually do this in existing JavaScript um, as a compiled class that could be reused. I'm putting it together. It's going to be a few, a few weeks before I'm ready to bring it for anybody to actually play with. But I think, well, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, you don't have to apologize. Uh, so the key thing is, I don't think composite key actually solves your entire issue. It does allow partial garbage collection, but it doesn't allow mixing strong linkage. Right. Uh, Everything is always weak linked in composite key, at least. So the, right. that might be something to look at. Yeah. So Br Bradley, you and I should at some point compare my try once I'm ready to draw attention to it to your composite key, because you're right. They're they're solving um, they're solving essentially the same problem, maybe in different ways. So the key with composite key is. By having partial garbage collection, you can maintain the mapping even though parts of the mapping have been garbage collected out. So it's it can't be on the storage of the map itself. So that's probably the only significant difference is yours would garbage collect uh, essentially if any component uh, goes away, mine would garbage collect only if the key garbage collects. Right, well, right, that's correct. Let, let me say, I, I want to be part of that discussion as well, Mark, because mine might be a third option to consider, um, as, especially if I can get it working, which again, I'm weeks away from it, but I'm also rapidly developing it. And I'm combining ideas at the same time, including argument validation. It's, it's going to get interesting. Um, but I'm not there yet. Okay. <laughs> I don't have anything else for this group. Thank you, Chris, for, um, sharing the screen here. Yeah, the, the, I have, uh, only one, one comment, which I think, uh, related to being able to define what are the things that we're going to ask to the committee to look at or to make it easy to create membranes and so on. One of the big challenges that we have is with the uh, with the with the shadow target. 
Uh, and the second one is with the, um, when the shadow target happens to be a function, uh, the name of the function and so on is also problematic. Um, so as, as a result of that, we ended up having to do a lot of forking logic to make the proper determination about what the shadow target should look like in order to match the real target. And uh, on top of that, we had to wrap the shadow target with another proxy in order to provide the proper naming and so on for that, if it happens to be a function. Um, I think th those two little things, Go ahead. I, yeah, I didn't follow that. You're wrapping, you'd have an additional level of wrapping of the shadow target with a proxy? Uh, I believe that's what we do to solve the name. I have to look at the code again, but uh, be, because of the, go ahead. What is the problem with the name? I'm, I'm not following. Especially when you are proxying for us, proxying the, the intrinsics and the DOM APIs and so on in order to keep them um, uh, to, to match the original semantics and the original name of the function and so on. So it's not observable for people to determine that this is a proxy. We want to keep that proxy to match the, the name in case of constructor and so on. Uh, so I have to look back at the code, but we do have some, we, we need to do, especially when doing distortions, when you create a distortion of a uh, array prototype join or something like that, you want to build a join method of, for that prototype that actually matches the join of the other side. Um, I'm just not understanding. Why is name different than any other property? I mean, I don't understand what the, what's the special. Right, for, for all properties in general, length is also another one. So length and, 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 and name and so on, because you don't really define the function. Uh, so there is no argument. There's nothing there. So the length will not match. So you do a proxy around it, so it does match when it comes to decide what kind of length you have and what's the name of the function and so on. Carity, um, I, I would like you to file a um, issue on my project um, illustrating the use case that you're describing here. It'd be ed educational for me to think about that as well, but I don't have time for that right now. I, I'm just not, I'm just not following. The, uh, you, if you just do a normal transparent membrane, then when the real target is a function, uh, the shadow target uh, is a function. And when the, the real target has a name and length property, you would set the name and length property of the shadow target to reflect the real target in just the way that you do any other property handling. I don't understand why there's a difference. Yeah, it had to be with, it probably has to be with abstractions that we have. Um... I have to go back and talk to JDD about it, but I, from what I remember about the, the names uh, of the distortions were were messy, so we were having a hard time trying to match the existing one. So I, I just don't understand why. What's what what what? Yeah, is, I'm, I'm looking at the code right now. I see never. that we when we create the, the, the shadow, we do create the. Oh. We do create the, the, the or rename the function that if it is a function, we rename that function to match the original function. But um, there was another thing about the names that force us to sometimes have an extra layer. Um, Mark, so in this I, case, you, you, you're right. We're just uh, redefining the product, the, the name and the length. Um, I think I see one thing that uh, Carity is bringing up, and it's actually really important the length property. Um, of a of a function is not settable, correct? Is it is it not configurable? I, I don't know. I don't have um, it in my code configurable, so I, I suspect it's not. Let me double check. Right. Let, let give me a minute or two to ramble out my thought here. I'm, it's still a little bit unformed. So let's say you create a shadow target that is just a raw function and nothing in it, no arguments. Therefore, the length is zero. Then you have a proxy for that. And you look up the proxy's length property. By de the proxy to the real target, let's say the real target has three arguments. So the length of the real target is three. Then you come back in the membrane. I'm, I'm sorry, in your proxy handler, you try to set the shadow target's length to three. I don't know if that actually works. Okay. 
I don't know if that's actually going to work because I think the length property of a function is hard code is defined um, as a read only property. I could be wrong about that, but if I'm not, this is something I haven't no, it's thought the, about. The, it's a, the array one is, uh, no, sorry, the, the length is, uh, uh, and I, I confirmed that Chris was putting it here. Yeah, length and name, both of them are configurable. So we configure them, um, looking at the code, and we do configure them mm. uh, when creating the shadow, you know, in order to match the Orina one. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't do that in ES Membrane yet. <laughs> um, when I create a shadow target, it's just a, a the minimalist object or function or array, and that could be a bug in my implementation. Whoops. Yeah. So I just, yeah, I just confirmed it is configured. They're both name and length are configurable. Yes. Are they both writable? They're both yeah. configurable, so it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, all right, I've gone on long enough. Thank you, guys. But, but to answer your question, they are both not readable, but since they're configurable, you can do what you want. Yeah, but you have to, tr you have to try catch it because it could be a proxy. Uh, excellent. We have um, a, mm, 10 minutes of usable time. Uh, do we have a topic that fills 10? So the, the two topics I wanted to raise, one was about going into more detail on that idea that Mark uh, presented from Peter about uh, multi-threaded code based on a single realm that's shared across threads. And the other topic was about module fragments which Mark uh, volunteered to co-champion. And so I just wanted to kind of talk through the feature uh, in, in some more detail than we have previously. But I don't know if either of those fits in 10 minutes. What is an a module fragment? Module fragments are the, the inline modules. They could be used for, for bundling, where module block are anonymous and module fragments are named. So that means that you can import it by name? Yeah, exactly. This is what makes module fragments suitable for bundling and module blocks unsuitable. Maybe they could be unified somehow, but there's a lot of tricky stuff to talk through. Yeah, one, one particular uh, thing that um, we need to better understand is module blocks create the static concept, the unlinked, uninitialized, uh, thing that can spawn initialized linked modules. Um, uh, whereas module fragments, if I remember, uh, what, you're, what you get when you, you know, what the module fragment evaluates to is a normal uh, linked initialized module. It doesn't directly do well, anything for reifying the static concept. Well, module fragments don't identify to anything. They can be imported uh, by the specifier that they point to, and that will give you this linked and reified thing. And but when you import a module block, you also get one of those. Right. So but it doesn't give you access to the static one. Right. That's what I mean. Said. That's what I mean. Um, so one thing that I've been thinking about is we've got okay. This 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 is um, uh, not something I've talked through with anybody, and it's, so it's probably ill formed in my head, but. Uh, does it make sense to say to take, let's say, our our import declaration in general, and have a form of it where, let's say, you proceed it with the static keyword, static import, and then you know the the uh, and then uh, module specifier, and what you get back is a static module record that just is the static reification of the module that would have been initialized and linked in the absence of the static keyword? Uh, that's an interesting idea because it kind of relates to this uh, exposing two stages of dynamic import. Like that could be used to statically load uh, a module, you know, initially to prefetch it, even when you're not going to actually run it yet. Yep. Um, this is something that Yulia starts of his, has raised interest in, in her investigation into this kind of partial module, uh, this kind of thing to, to improve startup time. 
Yes, yes, I think it exactly. I think it relates to that too. Um, so I think static might. I think lazy might be more intuitive than static, or something like that. Well, even thing, if static, you know, the word <laughs> the word static just isn't very meaningful in these well, contexts because it's so overloaded. Well, so yeah, so 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 the particular syntax might not be ideal, but the idea that you just whatever the resolution machinery is that you find a way to engage it up to the point that it gives you the static module record uh, as a reified static module record. So for example, under the compartments um, abstractions for manipulating import namespaces, once you've got the static module record, you could then reuse it in another context, uh, linked, you know, initialized and linked differently with a different, uh, different set of import binds. Yeah, you know, you know, the other thing this might be useful for is when referring to references to assets, which is a big thing that people use uh, ES modules for right now in the tools ecosystem, but is not natively supported. Basically, an import statement can get you an absolute URL from a relative one and tell the build machinery that you want this asset, where the asset might be uh, an image, for example, and you import it and you get an absolute URL that you could then use in an image tab or something. And this kind of static import link semantically corresponds to that use case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do, do other people, like there are people who are more <laughs> skilled web developers than me in this call. Maybe you have comments on this. So uh, the solutions to, the, to that, uh, non JavaScript or just resolution results are wildly varied across tools. So I don't really have opinions. I do know that it's like dot meta dot resolved is probably forever blocked because web wanted it, demanded it be synchronous and node can't make it synchronous for a variety of reasons. So that one's probably out the window. There's the old asset oh. references thing, and maybe that would be useful instead of coming up with a entirely new semantic. Um, I don't know. Do you, do you have a sense of how these vary across the tooling ecosystem? Like I'm aware they vary, but I don't know all the details. So usually they're hooked up in build steps. Um, and so the build step intercepts whatever resolution is done ahead of time and does a resolve pass of some kind. The resolve pass uh, generates a full JavaScript uh, snippet. It's not always a real module and puts it in a place. Oftentimes for CSS and images and stuff, it doesn't use the same timing as ES modules. It actually hoists them to different locations. Like it's complicated. Um, it very rarely acts like ES module. There, there are very few build tools that want to act like an ES module because it would be a performance issue. No, stop making me sad. Uh, what about um, the lazy module, about, the dynamic import? This is just stating that you would need to do things like allow hoisting. You, you just can't do it under the current semantics, not that we can't add semantics. It would also be super valid. Like one, one problem that is unsolved by tools in general is having uh, a, a, a unified semantics for modules in general across HTML and CSS, which is, um, a hard problem to solve without chain with, without have without introducing a new notion of what a CSS module is that is distinct from what like the import semantics of CSS are disjoint the import semantics of HTML are disjoint um, creating uh, the notion of an HTML module and the notion of a CSS module that participates in ESM would be or participates in a, a shared notion of, of loading would be super valuable. Like for example, one of the 
uh, one of the frustrations I had as a, as a web developer, and I don't know how far along we've gotten since, but like five years ago was um, that you couldn't say uh, in your HTML file, you can't say um, refer to an asset that's provided by a different node package without reaching into the node modules hierarchy, which is brittle. Um, and, and the package managers reserve the right to move those things around. Um, and, uh, and, and, and likewise, if you have a CSS file, you, you can't import something from another package for the same reason, um, which is even more brittle because knowing where your peer dependencies are being laid out by the package manager is effectively unknowable. Uh, we, we, this should not be depressing, Daniel. This should be like exciting opportunity. <laughs> well, you know, they're they're like for each one of these things that are being raised, there are these. We cut out. No, wasn't me. Yeah, Daniel, your audio cut off. It needs to fit together. You are back. Yeah, we missed everything that you said, though. And you're muted now. Wait, are you talking to me or to Chris or? To you. To yeah, whatever you said last, uh, Daniel, uh, we lost all of it and then you came back. Oh, it was just a very short comment. Uh, the, um, the, you know, there are neat stories for how the, the proposed web standards are supposed to fit together to solve all these problems. And I don't know whether they, they really are going to work. You know, Chris mentioned the, the, uh, where the package manager puts the stuff and that's totally solved by import maps maybe. And, uh, and you know, there are proposals for what, how HTML and CSS module semantics should be, but these don't, you know, turn over and replace how HTML and CSS loading work. They're sort of, you know, very localized incremental modifications. Right. Um, so I kind of feel like whatever we do should be, you know, in the in this thing that we started off on about a static import form, uh, whatever we should do, we should aim for it to be adoptable in tools and not be something that kind of blocks on being implemented natively in browsers to be useful so that we could find these kind of practical incremental adoption paths. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you think that we could actually uh, validate things. I agree. Uh, I think that what, uh, when this topic came up last, Mark uh, drew a metaphor um, or a simile as it were to uh, the introduction of um, a module form for JavaScript. It, it did not replace the script form. The script form remains as the foundation. Um, and you have to explicitly opt in when you transition into the module form. Um, I, I suspect that something similar would need to happen for anything else that wants to participate in the module system. And that could be emulated entirely with tools. The um, yeah. So about about module fragments, I did want to say that there there are a couple different ways we could we could go about them. You know, one way is sort of like uh, what what I have up in the gist in the in the readme right now. In the readme right now, it says, you know. These have string specifiers, and in the web, they'll be they'll be used they'll be using URI fragments that append to the, the surrounding URL. Uh, an alternative that Gus Kaplan proposed is that instead we would use identifiers to name them, and that they would be in this kind of punned namespace that exists both statically, as well as at runtime. So they're they're variables but you would be able to import them because there would be this, you know, correspondence with something that's statically analyzed. And 
this, I think, uh, has some benefits in terms of providing a unified mental model together with module blocks, because we would say that the value of that variable is that static identifier, is that static module value. You know, this would only work for module fragments, module blocks, it wouldn't work for other things that you want to import. But, and the, the correspondence, I think we can do it in a, in a complete and, and sound way, because you would always be declaring these with a with a special form that would be statically analyzable. And when you don't use that particular syntactic form, it would be rejected. Uh, I, I wanted to talk about that with this group because I think this group adds a, adds a good amount of rigor to these kinds of analyses. I, you know, I initially shied away from this kind of punned namespace idea because it seems, uh, I don't know, it feels a little bit risky somehow in a vague way, uh, but I can't, I can't think of any correctness issues. It seems completely doable in a thorough way. So there's an issue on the module fragments repository about this. Um, any thoughts? I'd certainly like it better than strings because you can't have collisions then. So the, the lex there, so this would be, there would be a lexical variable in scope and the value of the lexical variable would be what? It would be the corresponding module block. Okay. The, mo the module block, the static concept. I mean, it, uh, yeah, exactly. Okay. But it would also be usable in a static import statement, which mod which normal module blocks can't do. It's it's an essential requirement that it be usable in a static import statement. So th this is all written up in that issue on the on the module fragments proposal. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not written up, uh, exactly, totally clearly. I mean, I have more things in my head that are not written down in the issue, but Gus presents a bunch of code that corresponds to all this. And I imagine he's thinking the same thing. It's just not explained fully. Okay. Um, uh, it's, it's given the time, it sounds like this is a good thing for all of us to uh, look at after the meeting. Yes. Yeah. And given the time, um, Thank you everyone for coming this week. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording.